Now I say this a lot, but how cool is this? You guys are getting a really inside look at this thing. Not everyone gets to do that. Bam! 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 Hitting U.S. Navy squadrons in mid-1971, the EA-6B Prowler was developed from Grumman's A-6 Intruder attack aircraft. The Prowler's primary role was to protect Navy ships and aircraft by jamming enemy radar and communications, but it could also perform electronic surveillance as well. Known as electronic attack, the EA-6B was more than capable of jamming anti-aircraft gun and missile radars, as well as radio, internet, and even cell phone communications. Although it didn't carry any guns, this aircraft wasn't without teeth. Carrying up to four ALQ-99 jamming pods, the Prowler was one of the baddest aircraft in the air. Although the Prowler first entered service during the Vietnam War, it has seen action in Operation Desert Storm, Enduring Freedom, over Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, and most recently, Syria. But after nearly 50 years of service, the venerable Prowler is now being replaced with the more capable EA-18 Growler, an offshoot of the successful FA-18 Super Hornet. Let's get up in the cockpit of the EA-6B Prowler at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum and explore the unique features of this aircraft. Like we like to do on Behind the Wings, we like to get you guys into places that most people are not gonna see and bam, here you are in the cockpit. How cool is this? And this is where two of the four crewmen sat. You had a pilot and three ECMOs, which are electronic countermeasure officers. And their sole purpose was to jam radar sets, listen in on radio conversations, and generally wreak havoc on the electronic battlefield. And they did a great job at it. One of the things I really love about this cockpit is it's been signed by one of the former pilots. It's a Lieutenant Commander J. Elrod, who was known as Yum Yum. But VAQ-134, which was the squadron that flew this aircraft in combat, was transitioning over to the EA-18 Growler, which is actually the Hornet version of this plane. And so they didn't need these anymore, and we are lucky enough to have gotten what's known as the CAG bird. That's why it's so colorful. And CAG stands for Commander Air Group, which means the guy that commanded the entire air group on the George H.W. Bush flew this plane, and I'm sitting in it. If you take a closer look at our Prowler, you start to see some interesting details. Like on the wing of this aircraft, there's what looks like a bomb. Nope, this is just a drop tank but there used to be a weapon here. Now, what would have been carried here on a real mission would have been an ECM pod, which stands for Electronic Countermeasures, which is a bigger part of this guy's mission, which is SEED, which is Suppression of Enemy Air Defenses. It's a whole lot of acronyms being thrown at you at once, and trust me, it does not come off the tongue very easily. But that's the mission of an EA-6B, is to suppress enemy aircraft defenses. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you've got anti-aircraft missiles, anti-aircraft guns, they're all controlled by radar today. And the pods that would be right here are jam-packed with electronic gear that can totally take out these things by jamming them. But better yet, they can launch a very specific weapon. This thing doesn't carry bombs, it doesn't carry its own guns, it carries a very specific weapon called a HARM. One more acronym. That's High Speed Anti-Radiation Missile. This guy is incredible. It's got a speed of 1,400 miles an hour and a range of nearly 100 miles, which means that these guys can sit way back, launch their missile, and even if the bad guys turn off their radar, the HARM remembers where they are and boom. No more problem for the fighters and the bombers. 
I'm standing in front of the spaghetti bowl, at least that's what I call it. It's nothing more than really just all the wing fold mechanism for this aircraft. Now why would you want to fold the wings? Because like I mentioned earlier, this is a Navy plane and when you're on an aircraft carrier, space is at a premium. So what do you do? You fold the wings and you can jam a whole lot more planes together. Just look at all that detail up there. Somebody had to think all that stuff up, and I'm glad it wasn't me, because I ain't no engineer. That's why I'm in the museum field. But let's do one more thing here. Let's go talk about the history of this plane in VAQ-134, because that's the important part. Bam! What is this? It's Garuda. All right, what is Garuda? Well, Garuda is the Hindi folklore mount of Vishnu. All right, I don't understand all that, but it was pretty cool to the guys that started VAQ-134 because they named their squadron the Garudas. So this is one of two aircraft in our collection that has actually seen combat. I like that kind of stuff. Most of the other planes in here are just trainers, but this guy, been there and done that. While the EA-6B Prowler is no longer in service, VAQ-134 still is. So let's go check out what the Garudas are flying at the home of Electronic Attack, Naval Air Station Whidbey Island, Washington. Woo! It is a chilly, brisk morning here in Washington State and we're at NAS, BAM, Whidbey Island. NAS standing for Naval Air Station. It's the home of VAQ-134, the Garudas. Woohoo! And it's the home for airborne electronic attack for the entire Department of Defense. That's a huge job, which means there are 8,400 different sailors here on base. And since we haven't seen anything, it's time to get going. Naval Air Station Whidbey Island is located two hours northwest of Seattle and has two locations on the island. Alt Field is where you'll find the EA-18 Growlers, which we'll check out in a bit. But first, we're going to the original side of the base on the seaplane side. So we're on the support side of NAS Whidbey Island. So what does that mean? Well, actually, it means that the base exchange is right over there, and you can't see it, but you're gonna see it through the magic of the camera. There's also the grocery store and the gas station, basically everything you need to live here on the island. Now, the cool part about it is that the building that the base exchange is in used to be a PBY base. Now, a PBY, you'll probably know it better as the Catalina, was one of the most famous aircraft of World War II, and it's a seaplane. So you're actually looking at an old seaplane base from 1942. Now, why was it here? Well, we're right next to the Pacific. Who was in the Pacific with us? The Japanese. It's 1942. We got to keep an eye on them. They had submarines out there, and we had to have our patrol boats out there flying around to make sure that they didn't come here. As cool as that is, and as beautiful as the scenery is, there is way more to this base, and let's go check out some of the awesome stuff that's here. As we headed up to Alt Field to find some growlers, we stumbled across this interesting contraption that we had to show you. Holy smokes, look at this thing. We were just driving around kind of exploring the base and we came across this. What is it? Well, it's actually where the ABs train. Now, what is an AB? If you don't speak Navy, that's Aviation Bosun's Mate. And those are the guys that are on the flight deck of a carrier, and they're responsible for aircraft movement, aircraft firefighting, all that kind of stuff. And if you get onto an aircraft carrier, you have to take this training. And that all goes back to 1967 when there was a massive fire on the USS Forrestal and they had a heck of a time trying to get it out. So now, no matter where you are on a carrier, you take this training. It's kind of like the Marine Corps. Every Marine a rifleman, every carrier sailor a firefighter. There's still more to come. Let's keep going. So 
So we've been boogieing around the base on a windshield tour and we've seen some awesome things, but this is why we're here. Home of electronic attack, more than 17 different VAQ squadrons. But why is NAS Whidbey Island right here? That's what we're gonna find out next. Good timing too. I was ready to get out of this Pacific Northwest weather. To answer my questions about the base was Public Affairs Officer Mike Welding. So Mike, as we were doing our kind of windshield tour of the base, um, we started on the other side, which was the seaplane base, but we're not, I mean, we're right next to the water, but we've got a runway here and it's called Alt Field. How did Alt come about and is it named for anybody? Well, so w when they established the base, seaplane base was, of course, the first base that they had here for patrol missions. And it was uh, surveyed in 1941 and they established that, but they were also looking for a base where they could have land attack aircraft and they needed some place that was relatively flat. Clover Valley provided that ideal location. It was a very rural area and there were mostly farms that were there. So um, the government was looking at that. And at the time there were hostilities going on with the Japanese and not outright war, but the survey for Alt Field actually happened on December 8th, the day after the attack at Pearl Harbor. So the Navy bought out all the land from about 20 farmers and it was about 4,000 acres. And that, that was Alt Field. The base was ultimately named after Commander William Alt who led the airborne attack against the Japanese fleet at the Coral Sea, which was very significant in stopping the Japanese advance down toward, towards Australia. And it was the first time that they had met the Japanese forces and fought them to a stalemate. That's a big deal. So let's jump forward quite a few years. Now, Whidbey Island is literally the home of electronic attack. And it's not just the home for electronic attack for the Navy, it's kind of service wide. Yeah, so electronic attack is one of the primary missions that we have here and, and uh, Whidbey is the home base of the Department of Defense's airborne electronic attack community. So in 1972, they brought the EA-6B Prowler here, and that was the Navy's electronic attack aircraft. The Air Force used to do the electronic attack aircraft. They had the F-111, which was uh, taken out of service in the 1990s. And then that mission became the Navy's mission electronic attack with the EA-6B Prowler. So the Prowler brought a significant improvement to the safety of our aircraft when they operate in a hostile environment. Over 1,600 American aircraft were shot down over Vietnam before we had that capability. By Desert Storm, it was down to about two aircraft that were shot down. So that's a, that played a significant factor in us being able to control that environment when we go into a hostile territory, and it has remained like that. With the Prowler, it came here in, in 1972. It, be, it was an aging platform in the early 2000s, and they picked the EA-18G Growler, which is a derivative of the FA-18 Super Hornet, to replace it, and that transition started in 2008 and was completed in 2015. Now that we have the base established, it's time to see these EA-18 Growlers up close. Now, if we could just find a Garuda to show us around, Here's a pilot, Lieutenant John McDonald. Tell us a little bit about how you got into the Navy and what you do for the uh, VAQ-134 Garudas. Well, I've uh, been flying since 2012, so a little over six years now. Uh, been in Whidbey since 2014 and been with the squadron uh, since 2015. Um, I'm a pilot in the squadron. Um, nice. So yeah. So you are flying this lovely thing right here. Yep, that's the uh, E18G Growler. Uh, the Groot has been flying it for about three years now. We were the last squadron to go uh, safer flight in this airframe. For that, we flew the EA-6B Prowler, uh, and then sundowned that in 2014. And we are lucky enough, actually, to have the old Cagbird for right. VAQ-134, yeah. and we are really <laughs> happy to have it. Thank you, U.S. Navy. <laughs> Let's go take a walk around this sure, thing and yeah. look at some of this stuff. All right. So since the EA-18 Growler is primarily a carrier aircraft, you guys have got a really serious set of landing gear here. 
Yes, we do. So you notice it's uh, obviously a lot beefier, more robust than uh, the landing gear you'd find on your basic civilian aircraft or even an Air Force fighter jet. How big it is really is so when we land on the aircraft carrier, we fly like a constant angle of attack all the way down to the, uh, to the flight deck. Um, so there's no flaring or any kind of cushioning of that landing at all. So it's got to be able to, yeah, it's got to be able to absorb that abuse. So hence the, the, uh, the largeness of the landing. <laughs> That's cool. Well, while we're talking about being on a carrier, let's go take of the wings because you guys do something that every carrier aircraft does. Yep. And That's you right. fold the wings. That's right. Let's yep. go look at that. What? Oh, sorry. I get all goofy when I'm looking at planes. All right, so right here is the wing fold, and so you guys can literally fold the tips of your wings up so you can get what? Correct, so from here to the length of the wing tips on either side, uh, you can fold the wings up, and that's so when you're on the deck of an aircraft carrier, it's obviously close quarters. So we raise those wings in order to create more space on the flight deck so the directors can park us in uh, tighter quarters. So, and your wingspan is like, what, 40, uh, 45. 45 feet. So if you can shave anything off of there, it's good for the carrier and getting more aircraft yep. on. All right, so you guys are more than just a regular Super Hornet. You're carrying ECM pods. I mean, that's the reason you exist. Correct, so we carry uh, typically up to three ALQ-99 jamming pods, which are the same pods that the uh, EA-6B carried as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. So those are used to target enemy radars and jam their signals. Um, we also have ALQ-218 uh, on each wingtip, which are essentially receiver pods, which can detect uh, emitting signals from radars, and then we can geolocate them. Okay. Um, and then we also have air-to-ground and air-to-air -air capabilities. So our air-to-ground weapons are the, uh, the HARM, AGM-88, okay, yeah. um, which targets uh, radiating emitters. Um, and then our air-to-air -air capability is the AIM-120, the AMRAM, um, used to target enemy fighters. Oh, that's very cool. Well, I know people are gonna ask when they see this video, so let's go look at what powers this bad boy so we can talk about how fast it goes. Because <laughs> that's what you wanna know, right? So this is where all the cool stuff happens. This is the arresting hook, which does what? Yep, so our tail hook, uh, when you're landing aboard the aircraft carrier, it'll be down um, and it'll take you from your approach speed, so roughly 130 to 140 knots based on your weight, um, to an abrupt stop as you try to catch one of the, the, uh, one of the wires with this hook. Ooh, I bet so. that's a uh, fun ride. Yeah, it is pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. And then these guys are the GE-414s, and that gets you from point A to point B really, really fast. Yep, so dual engine, you'll notice there's these uh, look like turkey feathers on the back. Those are the vents, the uh, variable exhaust nozzles. So the shape of the engine will actually expand and contract based on uh, throttle position and how much thrust you're kicking out oh, at that that's time. that's very cool. Yeah, these guys kick out, what is it, like 22,000 pounds of yep. thrust in afterburner? That's right. Each? Yep, each one. That's a heck of a ride. <laughs> it is fun. Uh, supersonic jet goes fast to the speed of sound, so. Woo. What is your top speed? Um, well, if it's don't have a whole lot of stores hanging off the jet, it can go uh, above 1.5, 1.6, so. But that typically with, uh, with our loadout, you're going a little bit slower. Yeah, I bet. You're carrying a lot of stuff. Speaking of carrying a lot of stuff, you have an Ewo in back, and I hear he's running around somewhere. He's somewhere. He's All behind right. me. Yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> let's go find him. It didn't take long after talking with Lieutenant McDonald to find an ECMO from the Garudas, and we found a good one. Lieutenant Rob Slow Roll Heller. So you were an Ewo. Yes. Um, what exactly does that mean? Uh, we're basically going after enemy radars. I mean, if you think about it, um, I don't know, a boxing match or even like kids playing uh, at a birthday party, a pinata, it's hard to hit that pinata when there's a blindfold over a kid's face, right? So I okay. think that uh, we basically just put the blindfold over the enemy's face so the U.S. can go in and uh, accomplish their mission and get out without ever being seen. I like that analogy, but you mentioned something that's interesting. Um, we have a prowler in our museum and that carried four guys. The growler only carries two. Is that more of a workload for you? Uh, it's definitely a huge workload, um, but just like everything else, technology has improved. As a crew, we really work together to knock out still the same workload that those four people had. That's amazing. So you're in your flight suit. 
but when you go flying, you're definitely in a lot more gear than just this. Oh yeah. Do you have some of that we can look at? Oh, of course. All right, slow roll. Take us through what it takes to get all of this stuff on, because you're not just flying in that, are you? No, absolutely not. So the four main pieces of gear that we mm -hmm. use, uh, my favorite would be the G-suit. So all air crew have a baseline G tolerance, uh, G's being the amount of gravity on the body. Okay. So one G would be normal Earth's gravity, and then two to three Gs would be two to three times the gravity, all right? Okay. So every air crew has a baseline for that. Mine's about three and a half but this bad boy gives me about an extra one to two Gs without doing anything, without uh, doing any type of anti-G straining maneuver. Oh, wow. So it's designed to have a few bladders in it, uh, one throughout the top of the legs and then one down near the calves where it, it helps me keep all the blood above my waist as we're pulling G's so I don't black out or pass out or anything like right, that. Right, otherwise the blood's just coming right out of your head and then your vision goes into tunnel exactly. vision and then boom, you're out. Without oxygen in your head or yeah. to your eyes, it gets dark really quick. <laughs> so. That's important if you're flying. Oh yeah, definitely want to be able to see if you're flying, you know what I mean? Uh, the next thing would be the harness. Now this has eight connection points that okay. connect directly to the seat. Uh, which is super important because that seat actually has a parachute in it. So if we eject, if that day comes for me, if I don't have this connected, I could be falling out of that parachute, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be super important to have <laughs> this connected at all eight points. All so important. Yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is that all this gear is very important. Yes. This is, <laughs> all this is essential for survival. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Next we have uh, the survival vest. Um, this has a few cool things on it. So this is our LPUs, if I remember, in water. It's automatically activated by uh, seawater. So oh, wow. if I'm knocked out or anything like that, I hit the water, boom, this can inflate right away. Oh, that uh, so really that's cool. super cool, keep you alive. We have a radio and we have a bunch of little pockets that have things like knives in them, we have flashlights, we have water, all types of things that can keep you alive if you're ever uh, in the wilderness uh, from after an ejection. Uh, lastly on this, we have uh, our air regulator. So this is gonna be super uh, good to have, having this oxygen hose, because as you fly 25, 30,000 feet in the air, air's a lot thinner, so we need to have something pop, pumping uh, pure oxygen to us at all times. And you wear that from start to finish? From takeoff to shutdown. Wow, okay. Yeah. Now, this being the Pacific Northwest, and this being a survival vest, is there some way to put like Starbucks in there or maybe Tully? Oh man, I wish. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe a few uh, hot cocoa packets. Ooh, you can nice. actually um, carry up to five extra pounds on that thing, oh, but really? uh, it's pretty heavy already. So it just depends. You got to really make some decisions on what yeah. you want to take. So this is the big coup de gras, right? The helmet. This bad boy is our Jahimix, Joint Helmet Mounted Cueing System. Uh, and this is super expensive for uh, what it does. So. It has a computer on the top of it, and it basically gives me a ton of information right to my uh, right to my eyes. So it's almost like having a HUD on your head. Wow, that is really cool. And I'm assuming it also works with like night vision goggles and all that kind of stuff. Yes, it definitely does. Yeah. So you were telling me earlier that you can, if you're literally wearing this and you're looking around and you can't find a target, you can look down and it'll look right through the plane. Well, it won't show you like the systems in the plane, but yes, you can definitely see something uh, right through. If it's below you, if it's to the side of you, if it's without your vision. Um, if I'm looking for one of my uh, wingmen, uh, I can definitely look out. And if I can't see him right away, I can get an indicator showing me exactly where he's at. That is so cool. Definitely. Well, Slow Roll, I appreciate everything. You have yeah. been awesome. Definitely. Now, are you flying today? I'm not flying today, but there are a few guys getting ready for a mission. So let's stick around for that. If you want to rule the electronic battlefield, this is your aircraft. 
It's given stealth to the U.S. military for nearly 50 years and is only just recently given its job to a more sophisticated aircraft. From exploring the unique features of the Prowler in our collection at Wings Over the Rockies, to visiting Naval Air Station Whidbey Island to check out the successor of this aircraft, the Growler, we've taken you behind the wings of the EA-6B Prowler. And this says over temp, but I swear it said oven temp. This is why it takes so long to film something. We always got planes going around, I have to look at them. This is much, is blah. Ah. Donald. <laughs> so slow. <laughs> All right. <laughs>